good evening, good morning, and all the time. I bring greetings from the <clears throat> sexual minorities, uh, ecumenical group from India. Uh, till recently, I was <clears throat> part of this group officially through the National Council of Churches in India, but I completed my contract with the National Council and I'm working as a freelancer and also accompanying this group. Uh, this evening, I'm just going to share about how uh, the National Council has taken up the issues uh, of sex and sexuality among the churches in India, which has 32 uh, members from the Eastern tradition to the Protestant tradition. So uh, it was a bit challenging one. Secondly, how we have approached the uh, churches to take these concerns further theologically and ministerially. And third, what are the possible sh shifts that we could think of? And finally, what are we expected? So quickly, I'll just browse through these uh, slides. Often the churches talk about inclusion, say that it is a church of all and church for all. But how long these are put in praxis matters to the churches at large. There was an issue faced by the church in 2009 when the Delhi High Court suggested the law ministry of the government of India to repeal the IPC section 377, which criminalizes, criminalizes the uh, same-sex <clears throat> activities. So we were approached by the media, what is the role of or the position of the National Council of Churches in India? We could not really uh, join with a right-wing approach or right-wing groups saying that it is sin and we are against. But at the same time, we have 32 different ecclesial confessions, which has got 32 different theologies. So we have taken, <clears throat> taken up a, a position saying that we need to study the whole issue, then only we will be able to tell. So we initiated a two year study engagement to facilitate a transparent inclusion as a mission, mission agenda. Kindly, next slide please. In 1990, the first ever discussion on sexuality was organized or initiated by the National Council where both the churches and the National Council had a different experiences. Even the participants, the church representatives, through Bible saying, I mean, through the Bible on the floor saying that we will not even read the Bible when you support the LGBTIQ plus communities. Even the statement which was adapted there was deferred and it was not even accepted by the National Council uh, governing body. In 98, the Students' Christian Movement to India started the initiated initiation, and 2004, the Ecumenical Christian Center also. So it took almost 14, 15 years with a great gap that the churches in India have taken up this issue. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, June 2009, it was a big uh, commotion there in India on the Delhi High Court uh, suggestion to repay IPC 377. So there are political parties were applauding and uh, supporters were the right defenders. The other social groups, the traditional groups, uh, probably I would say that the right-wing groups were also involved in this kind of an uproar, whereas the left-wing ideologues uh, were supporting. Religiously, almost all the religion, no religion was excluded in condemning this suggestion, whereas the cure community was expecting. I don't want to use the term victims, but it was from the statement, so I have, I'm using that. So the Q community was uh, expecting the churches and the other institutions to support. Next, please. So uh, we have taken it up a kind of <clears throat> uh, three areas to address these things. One is uh, political and ministerial dilemma, whether the churches could address it politically or ministerially. That was a big struggle that we had it. And uh, strategically, where we could position ourselves, it was a kind of a neutral position to show the, uh, indirectly show the churches in India and the media and the society saying that we are 
supporting indirectly, but at the same time, they have taken up a position to study the whole thing. Therefore, officially, we have initiated the two years study uh, program where there were interface. This interface was between earlier speakers also were mentioned between the LGBTIQ plus friends and the church leaders. This was a kind of an eye opening uh, event where the church leaders started hearing the stories of the LGBTIQ friends and their studies. So the theological roundtables, seminars and con uh, consultations, several things that uh, were organized in this two years study uh, initiative. Next slide, please. So uh, through this two year study process, we have decided indirectly or unofficially to support the legal battle uh, that, the, that happened in the Supreme Court because some of the religious groups, including <clears throat> some of the members of the National Council of Churches have gone to the Supreme Court and filed the case against uh, the suggestion of the Delhi High Court. So through the theological statements and affirmations from the church leaders, uh, we facilitated and given to the, uh, the group that were fighting to get a relief. So those theological statements were filed in the Supreme Court to get the uh, judgment in favor of repealing. I would definitely say that uh, we are not the only people who have initiated, but our document also have helped in getting uh, the IPC 377 repealed. Now it is repealed in fact. Uh, then the, it, we have taken it up as kind of a ministerial and diaconal intervention rather than human rights intervention. As a church, we need to look at ministerially and diaconally. Therefore, we have positioned ourselves in taking up as a ministerial and diaconal intervention in order to inculcate the culture of inclusion. Next slide, please. There were challenging uh, uh, are, are the lessons that the church have learned during this two year study project. As I have mentioned, the interface between the church leaders and the LGBTIQ friends uh, were the eye opening. If not church, then who was the basic question raised by both the church leaders and the LGBTIQ plus uh, friends? The second question we dealt with was uh, Is church capable of handling the issues related to sex and sexuality? Do we have enough knowledge in handling such? The third, of course, the same Bible we all read, but there are different interpretations. How to handle or how to understand that the interpretations that is favoring or supporting uh, the friends of the LGBTIQ and the others. So this was a struggle that's still going on, but we were able to uh, do a little bit on that. I'll come back to that later. Then third, I mean, the next question was, is church practice inclusion? Is church practice inclusion? We speak a lot, but when it comes into practice, really do we practice inclusion was then another biggest uh, question that was raised. Then is God judgmental? In fact, we, the human, the ministers, the theologians, uh, on the church workers and in and in coach, the adherents, we are judgmental, not God, because God loves everyone. That was the theological statement also be dealt with. Then, when God embraces, embraces all, how can church reject a few in the basis of their orientations are an act? Then, if, church of, if the reign of God is just and inclusive, is today's church believes that, and does it practice the just and inclusion uh, in its ministries and ministerial interventions? So the, the other question which we dealt was, is it not the radical in inclusion be the mission agenda of the church? If church is not practicing, promoting, affirming, and advocating the inclusion, whether we could call ourselves as church or a Christian church was the biggest uh, question that we dealt with. Kindly, next, please. These were some of the documents through the four years, uh, sorry, two years study that we were brought in. The first one, which you are seeing, is a theological statement. It is a highly theological. The second one is of 10 Bible studies which were written by the young uh, theologians or the postgraduate theologians that accompanies the first theological statement. And there was a, a faith and homophobia interfaith roundtable where the brilliant expressions on readings of scriptures uh, had come in that. So the faith and homophobia is an interfaith document 
what all the other religions talk about homophobia? Uh, that, that, that's, those are all the documents that were documented uh, together. The last one is the family and human sexuality, where the 40 issues related to sex and sexuality were dealt theologically and ministerially, and the churches uh, and the pastors, how they could handle these issues reasonably. Next slide, plus, please. The related interventions, what uh, happened during this process or the post-study process. Uh, the church and homophobia was the major theme. We developed a theological cu curriculum for the theological university here, which is, uh, which are about 58 theological seminaries are affiliated to this theological uh, university. Then we organized a pedagogy workshop for the professors who teach uh, the subject on sex and sexuality or homophobia in the seminary. Then congregation-based initiative uh, through the women's fellowship and the youth group were initiated. And also lots of interest groups were developed to have conversation uh, with the friends of LGBTIQ plus and who shared their testimonies and experiences in the church. And of course, the research and documentations were published too. I just would like to just highlight only one uh, area on the faith and homophobia, where there were seven faith groups the leaders had met together. It was a round table, a detailed theological conversation was held, a joint uh, statement was issued, where an interesting observation found was, no scripture discriminates anyone, only our interpretation. So it was a kind of a faith affirmation where all the seven faith leaders in India have signed and widely published. Next, please. How the radical inclusion is being advocated and affirmed. We invited the friends from the LGBTIQ and I mean, including the transgender friends to be part of the National Council of Churches Assembly, which happens once in a year, that's the topmost body. And they were uh, given enough uh, 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 stage to share themselves and also interact with the bishops and the other church leaders that created a kind of a big, big, big change uh, in the minds of uh, the bishops and the church leaders. And all the special gatherings and official meetings, they are part of it. And the exposure to the youth and uh, other congregation members also is organized. Worship and prayers were developed, especially uh, in National Council of Churches Assembly. One day worship was done by the LGBTIQ friends where they distributed the Eucharist elements where the bishops and others had to partake and they did, in fact. And we used the prayer as an advocacy tool where we prepared a one-page epistle uh, circulated among the congregations all over it. So uh, they, the people were uh, encouraged to pray for the issues related to sexual sexuality, especially uh, when they were uh, handled in an inhuman way. And there were several uh, theological affirmations also often being shared uh, through, the, uh, through the groups, uh, to the congregation members to have much more deeper understanding on this issue. Next slide, please. There was one theological challenge, uh, uh, theological or uh, kind of a uh, ideological challenge that we received is who includes whom? Whether it's the heteronormative people includes the LGBTIQ plus friends or LGBTIQ friends include the others. So that was a big challenge because we often refer to the term homophobia. It's one of the conferences very vehemently uh, being opposed to saying that don't say that it is a homophobia, rather it's a phobia of the heteronormative. Uh, probably we could much more ponder upon that to take this uh, further when we talk about uh, radical inclusion. Please, next. We proposed... Uh, also, sorry, we launched these shifts and we are advocating for these shifts among the congregations. One is moving from the conventional uh, missional approach to the covenantal missional approach where the building of rainbow bridges being emphasized. So all could be part of it in the very life of the church, not only as attendees or people who could sit in the pews, rather they could participate in Bible reading, singing, choir and all those uh, ministerial expressions. So moving from the uh, con conventional to the covenantal. Second one is postural care to the pastoral praxis. Postural care is more kind of a philosophical traditional one, whereas the pastoral praxis, which affirms the rights of the marginalized communities. And also the church is more comfortable in, uh, you know, uh, offering the charity support rather than giving a kind of a justice affirming support, hence. So the justice was the bottom line uh, in the ministerial 
uh, ship. The fourth ship which we proposed or which we learned to share with others is from moving from the Great Commission to the Great Commandment. The church is willing to work with the LGBTQ group friends in order to convert them. Rather, we encourage or facilitate the churches to love everyone as they love uh, themselves. Next, please. Well, the theological position is it's based on the gospel value of justice, love, and inclusion. It's nothing more than that. And let the churches be non-judgmental, unconditionally love and accept everyone as they are. Thirdly, it has to be a ministerial approach of embracing everyone rather judging and uh, uh, avoiding or uh, excluding the certain communities or the friends. Next, please. It's tough time for us to come together collectively to build a rainbow bridges for the just and inclusive communities by hand, joining hands together, praying together, working together, advocating together, together and affirming the rights of everyone together. Thank you. Yes, the Rainbow Bridges Church. Uh, Luke, follow your leader. The last speaker of the morning is the Reverend Alfred Candid Jarapillo, who is the pastor with the United Church of Christ in the Philippines. Welcome most warmly, Alfred. <laughs> 